Welcome to Tracing Your Family Roots. I'm Janelle Blue, your host today, and with me is my co-host, Chuck Mason. Before we get started, I want to thank the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society, who is the sponsor of this program, and also our producer, Sidney Sachs, and his crew for making this production possible. Chuck, good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad you're with us today because I know you know a lot about probates, and so yes. let's talk about wills and probation okay. today. Uh, you know, wills are, and probate records are a good source of a lot of genealogical information. If you can find them, um, you know, one of the things that I did, my third great grandparents had a very detailed inventory that was taken by the executor and, and two other parties that went room by room by room wow. through the house. And this was in 1855. And about 15 years ago now, one of my friends had a friend who, her boyfriend, bought the house that was, the family was Pancoast, was a Pancoast house, but they didn't know who it belonged to. And so I made arrangements to meet my friend and go up and see the house, but I suspected it might have been my third great-grandparent's house, and it was. And I went through room by room with the will, and there were a couple of things. There was a huge bathroom in the house. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't exist in 1855. Uh. That turned out to be my third great-grandmother's bedroom because they did it, they went at the top of the staircase when they got to the second floor and they went room by room by room. And huh. so the house was there, including the, the uh, kind of cellar that they had for like roots and things like that in the basement. But unfortunately, all the barns and outbuildings were, were gone. So Well, that must have been a structurally sound house yes. to have yes. survived yes. all these years. Yes, uh, because they probably built it sometime, well, they bought the property in 1827. Uh, and, you know, wow, that's so early. at some point that's after that, early. they built, built the house and it was still still standing so so just to kind of give people a, an idea of probate because it can be a long process so you know people either leave a will or they don't leave a will they die testate or intestate and all of the probate is governed by the state legislature but you know if they leave a will basically the will usually delves out what goes to what person. It usually leaves at least one, but it may be several people who can serve as executors. And when the person dies, the will is presented to the probate court. The executor is authorized and given a certificate. Uh, I've done this three times, my parents and an uncle. And so you get a certificate that authorizes you to carry out the business. And then depending on what is in the will, you may have to post a bond that can be waived in the will. Mm -hmm. That's up to the person making mm -hmm. the will. But then you have to do an inventory. You have to have an idea of what is there property-wise also kind of included, although it's not necessarily on the inventory, what bills are outstanding, what debts are, are owed, what might there be to be collected? You know, has this person, as my both my third great-grandfather and third great-grandmother did, loaned money to people? So those were debts that that executor had to collect. And then once everything is you know, taken care of, it may involve, as, as it was in the case when I was the administrator for my uncle's estate uh, and the executor for my parents, it may involve selling the house and other property. Then when everything is paid off debt-wise, then the executor distributes to the heirs their portion of the inheritance. 
And that will is a genealogical treasure, isn't it? Yes. Because it's going to name children. It's, it's going to name other people, people in a family that were important. Yeah. The executors have yeah. some relationship. Yeah. Yeah. It's, the, the it's one, terrific. One thing you find with wills is sometimes when the will was written, when it goes to probate, things have changed. You know, it used to be. You know, earlier on, most of our ancestors didn't think ahead. My parents' will was written in 1987 or 1989. I can never keep straight which year. When my mother was going to have surgery. Mm -hmm. And so, but it was 2003 before my father died and 2007 before my mother died. Well, there wasn't a great deal of change, but they did own a small apartment building. Well, that had been sold off. So that wasn't a part of the estate. I didn't have to worry about trying to sell that. Yeah. I just had to, had to sell yeah. the house. And if somebody doesn't leave a will, and, and going back to the will, I found that most of my ancestors did not leave wills. That's there not unusual some, in that era. But you know, yeah. the further back you go, when you get into the 20th century, you find more wills, but the 1800s and 1700s, you know, I would say probably one will for every five to 10 people I've looked for a will. And part of that may be the amount of property that they had or, well, you yes. know, just the amount of assets yeah. that they had. And yeah. if it was just a few, they didn't yeah. figure it was worth yeah. it. So, but if the person does not leave a will, then the state determines how the property in the estate is going to be divided up. And, you know, similar process instead of an executor, someone in the family goes into the court and petitions the court to become the administrator because there is no will. Mm -hmm. Now, I was made the administrator of my uncle's estate because yes, there was a will. My mother was the sole heir. She was to be the executor, by the time my uncle died, she was in assisted living with Alzheimer's. My father was the alternate. He had died 14 months before mm. my uncle. Mm. So kind of the court allowed me to be the administrator, partially because everything was going to go to my mother. Uh, so, you know, so the party who is interested, or parties, who's interested in becoming the administrator, petitions the court. They determine who the administrator is going to be. In that case, they definitely had to post a bond. And then the same thing. You have to create an inventory. You have to collect debts that are owed. You have to pay off the debts that are owed to others. And then once everything is gathered and you have all the money, then it can go to the heirs under probate. In the case of my mother, we had a will, so everything still went to her. But if it had been a case of he had not left a will, then it would have gone to, well, normally it would go to spouses, children, grandchildren. If there were no spouse, as there was in the case of my uncle and no children, then parents, if they're still living, or siblings, on down to nieces and nephews. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things that you have. In this case, you have the will, but circumstances did not match what uh, you had as far as the will. Ah. So, something else had to be done with it. So, so looking at probate. Uh, you know, in the real world, one question is, why can't you find an ancestor's estate? Why can't you find a will? Well, you know, going back to the 1600s here in this country, we had them, but as I already said, people didn't always know to think ahead. Usually wills, most of the time, the ones that I have found, have been drawn up maybe during their illness or, you know, there's something going on that they don't expect to be living very long. So they will create a will, uh, you know, and, and 
One of the other things is how much property do they really have? Do they have a lot of property or do they just have personal belongings? You know, if it's just personal belongings, they may not have bothered, although one will that I found, I was just looking through for something in, in a will book and I found one that I thought was very interesting. It was a lady who created a will. She left her best petticoat and a gold watch to one of her granddaughters. <laughs> now that told me she valued those two items and she had a relationship with that granddaughter uh -huh. that she wanted to see those personal items went to her. And, you know, I did a little bit of research. She had a number of other granddaughters that, uh, you know, so that, that was tells the only me one that got the goods, they, were, right? they were evidently very close. Uh, you know, same thing with administrations. If they didn't really have a whole lot of property, probably nobody in the family is going to bother to go into court and take in, and uh, you know, settle or, or go to the trouble of trying to settle an estate that maybe is their personal possessions. That's but all. You, you know, I, I've seen some wills that in, in the, I mean, they leave their mattresses, they oh, yeah. leave the wash tub. Oh, yeah. Now, these are early oh, yeah. on, but everything that has any value, even if it's a few pennies, yeah. is listed. Yeah. 1873 was when my third great grandmother died and she left each of her children specific household items. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in one case she left one of her sons a dozen chairs. You know, that was an unusual item. But, you know, <laughs> a dozen. A dozen chairs, very, you know, and, and when her husband died in 1855, he specifically left her certain things, including like cows and, and other livestock. And then he created something called a codicil, which is an amendment to the will, where he specifically named the cow that he wanted her to have. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you have these interesting things that, that happen. You know, for, for a genealogist though, uh, knowing the possessions that they had gives you some idea yes. of sort of the economic situation yes. and also perhaps even their career, their, yes. their occupation. Yes, because uh, oftentimes you find like more in less in the inventory, you know, like I say, the possessions and this will went room by room. Others I've seen didn't designate rooms, but you could kind of gauge things by the listing of items. Okay, they were going through the kitchen. And, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, tools of the trade that, you know, that they may have, yeah. have had. Uh, yeah. You know, one of the things that people often ask is, who determines probate law? Well, it's the state legislature. The legislature decides what the process is going to be. Uh, in the case of, of a, an intestate estate, who the heirs are, who are going to get what, uh, the amount that they may get, and things like that. And so, you know, it's prescribed. And those change over time. And you can have you know, two states right next to each other that have almost completely different, different. ideas on how to handle probate. Right, so. and that's that's another reason why in today's world you should update your will if you're moving to a different state, state. and you yes. intend to stay there. Yes, my, my grandfather and grandmother up in New Jersey both had wills. When my grandmother died about, about six months later, my grandfather decided to move down to Virginia Beach mm. in with my aunt. So he had to go and create a whole new will. In fact, at that time, uh, the executor could not be somebody who wasn't a resident of the state of Virginia. Oh, really? And of course, my uncle in New Jersey was the one in the will mm -hmm. written in New Jersey. So, you know, uh, as far as like the intestate estate, again, it's the state that determines all of that. And it's the state that determines who can administer an estate. Now, you know, with 
circumstances where you may have no heirs left, then there are other things or provisions in the, the probate law that allows different ones to be appointed an executor. You know, sometimes you will find property being exchanged before a person dies. Yes. And so that almost serves as a little bit of a, yeah. a will in a, yeah. in, a, in a different way. It doesn't have to be probated because it, it's a transaction while the person's yeah. still alive. But it's really helpful if they've distributed all of their property yeah. and, before they And that, that may be why you may not find a will. They may have sold off the house and most of their other possessions and just have the few things, personal possessions, with them, and of course, that is helpful to, to find that. Or they've um, just changed title, they continue to live yes. there, but they've already yes. moved the yeah. title. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes it's for a really small amount. My grandfather and grandmother built a house in 1920. They separated sometime in the mid-1930s, and for the rest of their lives, they lived two blocks apart in the same <laughs> city. My grandmother <laughs> and the kids stayed in the house. And after my grandmother died, my, my mother's one brother, who never married, you know, had the house, stayed in the house. And at one point, my grandfather wanted to buy a new car. And he had about half of what he needed. And because of his age, he was in his 70s, the bank wouldn't give him a loan. Oh, those were the days. So he said to it's my uncle. It's not allowed anymore. Uh, my, he said to my uncle, if you'll give me the balance, I'll sign the house over to you. Golly. So I know that it was about $2,000, but on the deed, it's for $1 yes. in the love and affection. In the love and the, you know, So, yep. you know, and as far as probate records, they are, for the most part, fairly easy to get. Uh, you know, mo many of them are on microfilm, and many of them have been uh, microfilmed and copies available, like through the Family History Center on their their website. But even the courthouse, you know, you can go in in a lot of states, and the day after the will is completely settled, the clerk's done all the paperwork. You can walk in. I could walk in and get your will. Yeah, and you could yeah. get mine. Yeah, uh, so it's they're fairly easy to get. The one thing is the cost of legal documents. Mm. You know, they're they're usually not fifty cents or a dollar like we sometimes can get them at archives right. or libraries. Right. They they may be quite costly, uh, but you know they are they are there, and of course where they may be housed may differ also you may have periods of time when the records are in the courthouse, but then after time they will move them elsewhere. So for example, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, I know the state had the move wills going into the early 1900s to the state archives. And so they may still have copies in, in the courthouse, but mm -hmm. there are copies. So, you know, it's, if the courthouse burns, you're not likely to <laughs> lose all of those <laughs> copies like, like we sometimes have with things. Well, and there's a lot online now. A lot of them have been digitized. I know I'm yes. doing a lot of research in North Carolina, and there's, there's a lot of those wills have been digitized, yeah. and they're just there for anybody to see. You can yeah. go into that site yeah. or on Ancestry. Yes. And get yes. them. Yes. So, so I want to talk about my father's great aunt Della. Okay. Uh, you know, great aunt Della was quite a character. She was born in 1874 in Vineland. Uh, her parents, her, her mother had married shortly before the Civil War and her husband died in the Civil War, so she had three half-siblings. Her parents married shortly after the Civil War, and so she had uh, the half-siblings, and then she also had three sisters and two brothers. One sister and one brother died when they were young. She was my 
great-grandmother's youngest sister. Mm -hmm. And she married a man by the name of Harry Cheeseman in 1902. Now, Harry was born, he was a little bit older than, than Della. He was about eight years older than Della. And Harry was married to a sweet young thing when he was 25 and she was 17. And of course, when I was trying to find information about Harry, I couldn't find anything on him. Yet my grandfather's sister wrote a family genealogy Ooh, where she specifically killed him off on July the 14th, 1914. I couldn't find anything. Tombstone, death notice, obituary, death certificate, nothing. And I asked my father, I said, what do you know? And he said, I don't know a whole lot, but when I was a kid, anytime his name came up, the kids got chased away. <laughs> so uh -oh. he said, there, there was something there. And he said, I don't know for sure, but he said, I think he may have drank, but he didn't know. Yeah. Well, eventually I finally found Harry's tombstone quite by accident. He didn't die until 1928. Mm -hmm. And he died out in West Virginia in a Salvation Army hospital. Oh boy. So that, that led me to find things. And, and that's how I found the divorce record from the first wife. And reading through the, the record, they were married about two years. And Daddy did an affidavit in the court and basically what he said in it was he said to his daughter, you got two choices, either divorce him or you and him get out because I'm tired of supporting you. Ah, this well, was the first wife. This was yeah. the first wife. Yeah. Well, then as I started digging through more of Harry and Della uh, and talking to some other family members, Harry did drink and he didn't really like to do a whole heck of a lot. Although everything that I found in, that included an occupation said he was a glass cutter until his death certificate. And he was working in the mines out in West Virginia mm. on the, the death certificate. But you know, they, they married and Della, I don't know exactly where she got her money, whether it was just from hard work or what, but Della was quite industrious and she owned a piece of land in Southern Vineland, New Jersey. And sometime after their marriage, she established kind of a mom and pop grocery store because South Vineland was really outside the limits and it was all farmland. And so, they needed something so people yeah. didn't have to run into town. Not that it wasn't that it was far. It was only you know a mile and a half, two miles to right. get into town, but still yeah. the convenience. In those days, yeah. Yes, and so Della had this store, and at some point they decided that they needed a firehouse in South Vineland. So she subdivided her property and donated the fire the land to build a firehouse. Wow. So they built a firehouse and Della put in a telephone in her bedroom so that if somebody during the night called and needed the firemen, she could answer the phone, she would go over to the firehouse, she would sound the alarm, she would start up the trucks. Oh my gosh. She would ride on the trucks if they needed, a, <laughs> or drive the truck rather, if they needed a driver. If they were shorthanded, she'd ride on the truck and she'd help fight the fire. She was the only woman who was an official member of the South Vineland Fire Company. Wow. And just, you know, I, I don't know that she ever was involved with the suffragette movement, but I have read, particularly with the anniversary, just a couple of years ago. I've, I've read a lot and I can just see Della marching down Pennsylvania yeah. Avenue. Well, she was living it, with, really. She, with the yeah. suffragettes. Yeah. And so Harry at some point disappeared. I can't, couldn't find him in the 1920 census till I knew to look in, 
in West Virginia. So he was off the radar map. Well, she did have a will that she created much long later in time, but had she died at any point when she was married to him, he would have gotten everything would have gotten under everything. the probate law. Yeah. Uh, you know, when he left, when she kicked him out or he left voluntarily, whatever, she still didn't have a will. He still would have inherited under the probate law. She didn't divorce him until 1924. My goodness. That's when, if her estate, if she died without a will, then would have been distributed to siblings. Mm -hmm. because her parents were both gone and Harry, fortunately Harry and Della never had any children. And then she did leave a will. She died in, in 1943 and she died of a lengthy illness and she had two nieces. One was my grandfather's oldest sister and one was the daughter of one of her sisters who evidently from what was the way the things were worded in the will. They probably both took care of her. She lived with my grandfather's mm -hmm. sister. Mm -hmm. So everything went to them. But had there been no will, had there been no siblings still living, then it would have dwindled down to nieces and nephews. Yeah, and so, yeah. it just keeps so, going further you know, down it, it's the, really, the tree. You know, and, and probate <laughs> records, I think, are so interesting. They can tell us so much. They can, and we are out, out of, time, of time. So we, I mean, I've got many stories would love to tell on a different show. We'll yes. have to go do this again. Yes. Thank you so much, Chuck. Thanks this for is having very me, informative and, and very interesting. Um, and if you have a chance to visit our Mount Vernon Genealogical Society, you're welcome to do that, mvgenealogy.org. Uh, thanks for, for listening. Mm -hmm.